Welcome to my switching routing and wireless essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Welcome, module 12, wireless LAN concepts. So we're gonna be talking about basic wireless LANs, components, operations, management, threats, and ways to secure the wireless LAN. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. First one is intro to wireless LANs. Typically a wireless LAN you'll see uh, denoted as a WLAN or WLAN. This is basically a type of a network that is using wireless as the physical media. Even though it's not technically physical, like you don't touch the wireless signals, it's still classified as one of those types of medias. Wireless allows for the ability to be mobile. You're no longer tied to a specific infrastructure. So that makes it a little bit nice. You can now be more versatile with your devices, whether it's the laptop, tablet, whatever the case may be. Wireless infrastructure adapts to the readily changing needs in our technology. To fit our needs, that infrastructure must also be able to be adaptable. Common types of wireless. When we say wireless, typically that will mean a data wireless network. Uh, IEEE 802.11 is going to be the big one that comes to people's minds. Home wireless uses 2.4 gigahertz or the 5 gigahertz range. That is that IEEE 802.11 standard. However, that is not the only wireless standard out there. We have WAPANs or wireless personal area networks. These are short range, uh, normally within you know 10, 20 feet, and it's based on the IEEE 802.15 standard, Bluetooth, and it also can use the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequencies. And again, that's gonna be like Bluetooth or Zigbee. Those are some of the more common examples. So if we're talking wider area, like city-wide, that could be a wall man, which is again, wireless man. Larger geographical area, this might be using things such as WiMAX, for example. Lastly, we have wireless WANs. WOWANs. These are extensive geographical areas, countries. This could be satellite or other high-powered wireless functions. So let's look at some of these wireless technologies. Again, Bluetooth, that's going to be the predominant uh, wireless pan. We're looking for things like under 100 meters. That's going to be things like our hands-free unit to our car or a headset. So those are two of the more common ones. Bluetooth has two main forms of connectivity. Bluetooth Low Energy, that's BLE, and this supports a mesh topology to a larger scale network device. And we have Bluetooth Basic Rate and uh, Enhanced Rate, BREDR. This will support more of a point to point topology and it's more optimized for audio streaming. When we are doing our wireless pans, it really just depends on what are we trying to accomplish and that dictates what version of Bluetooth we would be using. I said uh, earlier when we talked about a man, uh, something called WiMAX. WiMAX is a worldwide interoperability for microwave access. Uh, essentially, it's an alternative broadband wired internet connections. It uses IEEE's 802.16 standard, uh, wireless standard, and it's for wireless up to 30 miles or about 15 kilometers. Again, citywide wireless mans are probably looking at this WiMAX technology. Other wireless is going to be things like cellular broadband. That's going to be our mobile devices. Two main types of mobile devices either use the global system for mobile, GSM, or they use a code division multi-access. CDMA is very heavily in the US where GSM is used everywhere else. We also have a, a satellite broadband, internet via directional satellite dishes. That's another type of wireless, and that's more for the rural areas 
that cannot have high-speed internet via a traditional wired connection. So what are some of our common 802.11 wireless standards? Well, 802.11 became the first standard for wireless. That was about 2 megabits per second. It also used the 2.4 gigahertz range. After that, we had uh, two, the 802.11a. It no longer used the 2 gigahertz range. It now used the 5 gigahertz range. And it allowed for faster connectivity at 54 megabits per second. However, this was extremely expensive. An alternative to that was 802.11b. It used the 2.4 gigahertz. It also was a little slower, but it was a little longer uh, range and offered better uh, penetrability when it came to structures. With A, anything that, like a wall for example, would absorb the signal. So it wasn't very uh, realistic. B was a little slower speed, but could go the distance. After B, we got G. G also uses the 2.4 gigahertz range, but it allowed for up to 54 megabits, and it was also backwards compatible. One of the important parts here is recognizing the frequencies. If you have the same frequency, more often than that, most of these, uh, these systems are backwards compatible, but if they are different frequencies, they don't quite work like that. After G being the predominant technology for a while, we got 802.11n. This uses both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and allowed for drastically faster connectivity, though it required a technology called MIMO. And this is basically multiple antennas to allow for our signals. After N, AC became very popular. AC is using 5 gigahertz and again, drastic and uh, increase in speed, and it supports up to eight antennas. AC is where we are currently at. However, the 802.11ax is also starting to see some progress in the market share, and that is using both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and is being defined as a highly efficient wireless, so new, and it's capable of using the 1 gigahertz and 7 gigahertz frequencies. So we are slowly backing away from our free frequency ranges, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, that have been overly crowded. So AC is our current standard, AX is where we're going to be heading towards. So we're talking frequencies. Does that mean it only uses 2.4 gigahertz or what exactly does that mean? So our radio frequencies, again, 2.4 being the UHF, 5 gigahertz being the SHF frequencies. That's kind of in between the infrared and ultraviolet ranges. That's things that are visible. But the nice thing is our wireless, our satellite, our radios, our microwaves, all of them are still before infrared. Our ultraviolet is what we can see. So we actually cannot see any of our wireless devices. So we have to be able to understand how we can see these. Uh, if we can't see them with our eyes, we have to have a measuring. This is normally done through what's called a site survey. The site survey will see what frequencies are around us and it will interpret what those frequencies are so we can see saturation. Saturation is just how much wireless signal in a, in a specific range is at a given location. And you'll also notice, look at the amplitude and the frequency. Our frequency with our wireless actually is farther apart. As we start getting more towards visible light, our amplitude stays roughly the same, but our frequency actually compacts itself. When we get closer to gamma ray, our frequency is very closely packed together. So who organizes all of this? We have several wireless organizations. Wi-Fi Alliance is gonna probably be the largest and that's for predominantly the 802.11 wireless standard. However, if we're talking wireless in general, IEEE comes up with most of our wired and wireless standards. If we're dealing with 
uh, unionized uh, groups that are more international. It's going to be the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. They regulate and allocate uh, radium spectrums and satellite orbits. So this group is, again, international, but they deal with radio frequencies. What is very interesting is when you're in an area, let's say you have 102.7 FM. That's a radio frequency that you were given a license for. You pay for that license. Anyone that is using that frequency is in violation of your license. However, that license is for a specific area. Each new town or each new area may have the same frequency license for that area. I use 102.7 FM because it's very common, especially in the western US, and the interesting part is it's common and each town has their own radio station on that frequency. That just goes to show that that frequency is being licensed in that area. So let's move on to our different components. What's make up a wireless network? So in the lecture, there actually was a video looking at antennas and uh, ports that was outside of our scope. But antennas are what allow us to receive our wireless signals. Here we have a laptop with a wireless NIC. As we defined NICs earlier, a NIC is going to be any type of interface card allowing us access to that type of network. If we need access to a cellular network, we would have a cellular NIC. If we needed a Bluetooth uh, card, that would grant us access to the Bluetooth network. If we wanted to have access to a WiMAX network, we would have to have a WiMAX NIC and so forth. So what is really interesting is as we start developing more of our wireless technologies, we have to look at what our technology portions are. For the home device, it's going to be a router, it's going to be an access point, and it's going to be a switch all rolled into one. If we're talking business, normally business separates these functions for better functionality. For example, an access point, also known as a WAP, wireless access point or just an access point AP all of these uh, the, the purpose of this is actually about being able to take the wireless functionality and attach it to a wired network so if you have wireless clients they have to have access to a access point so they can gain access to the wired network here we have two types of APs, we have an autonomous AP, basically it's standalone and it's configured by itself, or we have a controller based AP. This is known as a lightweight access point. When we use the lightweight access point, it will communicate with some type of wireless controller. And for Cisco's realm, we are using the wireless LAN controller, WLC. Basically, each controller-based access point will automatically be configured and managed by the wireless controller that's on that network. And actually, that's what we have labs doing, is configuring both an autonomous AP and configuring a WLC-based network. Antennas are not made equal. We have three main types of antennas, omnidirectional which is basically providing 360 degree coverage. We have directional, and that's more of a focused area. And lastly, we have MIMO. MIMO is multiple input, multiple output base antennas. They will use multiple antenna types to increase bandwidth. So MIMO is more of a technology that the access point will use to allow for multiple antenna or multiple antenna types to allow them all to work together. So moving on, let's talk about wireless operations. All right, so we have a few videos in our lecture that cover things like BSS or ESS, which we're gonna talk about. So our operational modes actually have three main types of topologies, ad hoc, infrastructure, or tethering. 
Tethering is going to be some type of either wired or wireless tethering to like a mobile device and then using the mobile device to connect to a cellular network to get on the internet. A hotspot for example. Infrastructure mode is actually going to be a managed access point where we have wireless systems connecting to that access point and that access point connects to the wired network to get our internet. Ad hoc is like more of a peer-to-peer -peer between two wireless devices. We have our BSS and our ESS. Our BSS will use a single access point to interconnect all associated wireless clients, where a ESS is a union of two or more BSSs. And that way you can have multiple B uh, BSSs allowing for that communication. If we're looking at our wireless frame, an 802.3 wired frame is slightly different than a 802.11 frame. 802.11 is wireless, 802.3 is a wired ethernet frame. With our header, we're going to have things like our frame control uh, duration, we're going to have three address types, a sequence, and additional address types. That way we can actually have address, both source, destination, and of the access point. With wireless, we have our carrier sensing, media access, collision avoidance, CSMA, CA, which is slightly different than our wired version, CSMA, CD, collision detection. With our CA, basically we are in half duplex, and since we cannot hear what's uh, other organization or other devices are using, we're going to just try to listen to the channel. If it's idle, no other traffic is currently on that channel, we will then send a uh, RTS message. Uh, basically, that's a clear to transmit type message, or sorry, ready to send type message. And the access point will request a dedicated access to that network for that channel. The device will get a clear to send CTS message from the access point, granting them the access to send data. It will wait a random amount of time before restarting the process if there is no clear to send message being able to be received. The data will then be transmitted. Acknowledge for all transmissions will be there. If a wireless cli uh, client does not receive a acknowledgement, it assumes a collision occurred and then it restarts the process all over again. So how do the wireless access or how does the wireless device connect with an access point? Normally there are three stages. There is the discovery of a wireless access point through a beacon requests. The access point will authenticate against it. Then there is an associate with that access point. That way that access point will actually have that MAC address of that device geared towards that access point. As that device uh, goes through the network, for example, if there has to be a handoff between one access point and another, then that association will change. So how do we actually get successful association? We'd be looking at the SSID. That's the name of the network. We'd be looking at the password. That's typically some type of pre-shared key or passphrase used to connect to the network. There is going to be a network mode. That's going to be the appropriate 802.11 standard that will be used. A, B, C, G, N, A, C, A, X, and so forth. Then the security mode has to match. Are they using WEP? Are they using WPA? Are they using WPA2 personal? And so forth. Lastly, they have to agree on the frequency bands that they'll be using. All of those five things have to match in order for the association to begin. So the discovery mode can actually happen in one of two ways, passive or active mode. In passive mode, the wireless client will just sit and wait. The access points will actually broadcast beacons with the SID supported standards and security settings. In active mode, the wireless client will send out what SIDs it knows about and what supported standards it knows about, hoping that a access point in range knows about it 
and allows for that connectivity. This is called probing. The issue is, if a wireless client is the one that is sending out information, the access point, if it is a rogue device or a wireless hacking device, could actually modify its configuration to match the probe coming from the wireless client, and that leads to other security issues. So we have our CAPWAP operations. So our CAPWAP is going to be a control provisioning of wireless access points function. We're going to be looking at like the architecture, the flexibility connect, and so forth. So CAPWAP is an IEEE standard protocol that enables a wireless LAN controller to manage the access points and overall the wireless LAN. So the CAPWAP is going to be the protocol that the access points will communicate through back to the wireless LAN controller. So based on the lightweight access point, it adds additional security with datagram transport layers. That's going to be our D DLTSs. It will also encapsulate and forward wireless client traffic between the access point and the controller using a tunneling protocol, typically UDP port 5246 and 5247. It operates over both IPv4 and IPv6. Underneath IPv4, it will use the IP protocol 17, and underneath IPv6, it will use the IP protocol 136. So again, CAPWAP is that protocol used for communication. We can have what's called a split MAC architecture. And basically this concept applies all function normally performed by an individual access point and distributes them between the two functional components, a access point MAC function and a wireless LAN MAC function. So things like beacon and probe responses, that's on the AP. Things like authentication is on the LAN controller. Packet acknowledgements and retransmissions, that's going to be on the AP side. Association and reassociation of roaming clients, that's on the controller side. Frame sequencing and prioritization, that's on the AP side. Frame trans, uh, translation to other protocols, that's on the wireless controller side. On the AP mode, Things like MAC layer data encryption is, again, access. If we are talking about termination of traffic, that's going to be on the uh, wireless LAN controller side. So there are different features based off of the hierarchy that is used. Not everything will be tied to the access point. Not everything will be tied to the wireless LAN controller. There is a separation. So looking at the DTLS, Again, providing security between the access points and the wireless LAN controllers. We can actually encapsulate data that is flowing back and forth. It enabled by default to secure the control channel and encrypt all management and control traffic between the access points and the wireless LAN controller. While the data encryption portion is disabled by default, and it does require DTLS a license to be installed, on the controller before it can be uh, enabled on our access points. The functionality is there if security between the access point and controller is a concern. We also have our Flex Connect APs, and we have two main types here. Our Flex Connect basically enables the configuration and control of uh, APs over a WAN link, over a wide area network connection. So there are two main modes, connected and standalone. Connected basically means that the wireless LAN controller is reachable. Standalone mode means the LAN controller is not reachable. Basically, the Flex Connect access point will use the CAPWAP connectivity with the wireless LAN controller to form the tunnel and perform the function. With the standalone mode, the Flex Connect AP has lost the CAPWAP, so there is no uh, connection there. So the access point can assume some of the wireless function or the wireless LAN controller functions such as switching client data traffic locally and performing traffic authentication locally based off of the data that's on the access point. Moving forward we have our channel management. 
So with our channel management, that's more about frequency channel saturation. So as the demands for certain channels have become increasingly uh, there, we have to understand how we can over uh, saturate these channels and what can uh, be done about it. If we have a certain technology that can basically remove the degradation and the oversaturation of those channels, we have to be able to look at how those are ran. There are three main types. This is not all of them. This is just the three main ones that Cisco wants you to know about. We have a direct sequence spread spectrum. This is a, a modulation technique designed to spread a signal over a larger frequency band. 802.11b uses this. We have a frequency hopping spread spectrum, FHSS. This is basically used by the original 802.11 standard, and this will transmit radio signals by rapidly switching a carrier signal among the different frequency channels. Lastly, we have a Onogonial Frequency Division Multiplexing, OFDM, and it's a subset of a Frequency Division Multiplexing. This is used by 802.11, A, G, N, and A, C. This is the more predominant one. It will use a single channel, and it will use multiple sub-channels on adjacent frequencies to uh, improve communication. When we talk channels, in the U.S., we have 11 basic channels. Each channel is about 22 megahertz, uh, megahertz uh, wide. So with each channel, we actually have some overlap with neighboring channels. There are three channels that do not overlap with one another. Channels 1, 6, and 11. These are the primary wireless channels that should be in use because they do not in interfere with one another. 1, 6, and 11 are the ones that you should be using. If your neighbor uses 1 and your other neighbor uses 6, then you know you should be using 11, or vice versa. If you know that the majority of your neighborhood is using one channel because of a site survey, you would switch to the other channel that is not heavily in use. And again, the three ones are 1, 6, and 11. That's for the 2.4 gigahertz range. For the 5 gigahertz range, there are 24 channels, each channel being separate from one another by about 20 megahertz. Here we have things like channel 36, 40, 44, 48, 52, 56, 60, 64, and so forth. These are within the 5 gigahertz range. I'm going to be doing a separate video on 5 gigahertz frequencies just so that you are aware. So when we're talking about our deployments, we need to be able to understand what a wireless site survey is, first of all. Second, as we are deploying our wireless technologies, we need to look at overlap. Where are the access points going? Is there sufficient connectivity between the access points? Is there enough coverage for the entire facility? Are there any weak spots? That way you can use that information to determine how many access points need to actually be deployed and configured. And again, you do this by doing a wireless site survey. You want to make sure you are using overlapping wireless uh, connectivity, but each access point should be on different frequencies. You don't want to overlap the channels 1, 6, and 11. You want to be able to, to separate them. So maybe having one access point 1, you know what, I'm going to draw. Maybe this one is going to be channel 1. This could be channel 6. This one would be 11. That meant this network over here will also be network 1. That way it's not interfering with 11, it's not interfering with 6, and this one and this one is far enough away that they should not interf uh, interfere with one another. Moving on is our wireless threats. Things like interception, intrusion, rogue access points, and denial of service. So again, those are the main types of issues. Denial of service, like anything else, could be because of improperly configured device. Accidental interference is also there. Or malicious user intentionally interfering with the wireless 
communication by doing like the auth. Normally how we do this is we set it so that access points are configured in such a way where they are not using peak hours. Meaning if your office is open 8 to 5, wireless is not turned on at midnight. Wireless is not turned on at 3 a.m. Wireless is not turned on on Saturday. The technologies are actually kept off when they are not in use. So they're only turned on by during business hours. Other ways to minimize the uh, threat is properly configure the devices. Harden the devices. Make sure to have backups of the passwords and whatnot. Rogue access points are another one. A rogue access point is an unauthorized access point plugged into a wired network that produces wireless signals. Pretty common in most businesses. You can have an employee that wants Wi-Fi in their office without having to connect to the corporate Wi-Fi so they plug in their own access point. That is a rogue access point. And sadly it happens more than it should, but it does. Rogue access points could be uh, accidental, like the example I just gave, or it could be intentional because of an attacker. We have man in the middle types attacks. That is where we have someone listening for wireless connectivity. We actually sit in between the legitimate access point and the possible victim. We configure our access point to capture traffic or to mimic the actual corporate network using like a hack five pineapple for example that way we can actually seem like a legitimate uh, device we have end users connect to us and we start collecting data so how do we secure all of this some common ways are things like ssid cloaking mac address filtering or other forms of authentication and encryption SSID cloaking, basically access points and some wireless routers uh, will take the SSID beacon frame and it will set it to disable. However, realistically, most common wireless scanning devices now can figure out the SSID even if the broadcasting of that SSD is disabled. So cloaking the SSID is not always as secure as it should be, but it's better than nothing. We also have MAC address filtering. If you have a few devices on your network, you know all the MAC addresses. You could set it so that MAC address filtering is turned on. However, if you want to add new devices, you have to capture the MAC address of the new device and then allow them on the wireless network. That can become a pain as the network grows. Open, uh, we have authentication types like open system or we have a shared key. If we're using things like WEP or WPA, those are shared key. If you're using an open system authentication, it may not be a password, but it could be other forms of authentication. If you're in a hotel or an airport, for example, you may be given a, what's your hotel room? Not really a shared key, but a other form of authentication uh, method. We have three main types of security. We have WEP, WPA, WPA2, WPA3. WPA2 is the most common and it uses AES for its encryption. WPA3 is becoming more common. It is slowly starting to take over and it uses the protective management frame, PFM, PMF type security. We have two main types of any type of security. We have personal using a pre-shared key or we have enterprise if uh, enterprise will connect to like a radius server or tacac server that allows us to authenticate using a username and password not just a passphrase with personal you're going to be using a pre-shared key to everyone everyone has the same pre-shared key with enterprise we can actually denote individuals Encryption methods, there are two main encryption methods, AES and TKIP. TKIP is Temporary Key Integrity Protocol. It's used by WPA1, provides basic support for legacy technology. AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, is used by WPA2 and is the newer standard. Those are both heavily used both in WPA2 
personal and enterprise. In our enterprise, we have a few more things to set up. We have a radius server. That's going to be the thing that we're authenticating against. We have ports for that radius server. Normally ports 1812 and 1813, and it could also be 1645 or 1646, all UDP. There's also a shared key between the access point and the radius server that will authenticate the access point and radius server. Normally, authentication and authorization is handled by the 802.1x standard, which will also provide centralizing uh, information like a radius server. WPA3 has personal and enterprise, but personal will use what's known as SAE, simultaneous authentication or equals of equals. WPA3 enterprise will use 802.1x but it does require the use of a 192-bit cryptography suite and eliminates the mixing of our different protocols. Enterprise will also use some type of radius dice type server. With WPA3, we also have two other types of connectivity. Open Networks does not use any authentication. However, it uses a opportunistic wireless encryption to encrypt all the wireless traffic. So it's no longer just all plain text. When we're talking IoT-based devices, there's an IoT onboarding, and that will use the device provisioning protocol, DPP, for quickly onboarding IoT-based devices. And that is actually all I had for this chapter. We talked about different wireless connectivity standards, we talked about the security, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about the modes, the speeds, the frequencies, and the channels. And that is all I had for this chapter. Questions or concerns, definitely please reach out and I will try to get those questions answered as quickly as I can. Thank you.